Anyway, my dad is very good at evangelizing, and I asked him once, how do you do it? What's your secret? And he gave me something that I've never forgotten, and I use to this day. He says, there's one thing that you know is true with every person that you meet who's not a Christian. One thing that you can just go to very quickly, that it's, it's inside them. They may deny it. They may act like it's not there but you know they're lying to themselves. You know it's there. It speaks to them every day, and it's guilt. Guilt. That's a, you know, I, I work in counseling, in secular counseling, and one of the number one reason people come, they don't call it this. I call it an illness or something else. They don't call it this. But one of the number one reasons people are depressed, you look at loneliness being one of the symptoms, but one of the number one reasons people are troubled in their life is they have guilt. They feel guilty. And sometimes they feel guilty about a particular event in their life. They have shame. And you know what that feels like. I know what that feels like. Uh, we keep some of that stuff hidden. We hide it. We don't talk about it. We lie to ourselves. We act like we didn't do it. We excuse ourselves. And so we got this guilt. What do we do with the guilt? So when we evangelize Muslims, let's just go ahead and try to get as quick as we can to the guilt problem. And if we can get to the guilt problem, they still have it. It's still there. For us Christians, we have a solution. Not just a remedy that may work. We have a solution that can give us a clean, clear conscience. And what is a clear conscience worth? How, do you, how can we have a clear conscience with God? To know I'm right with God. My dad, I love my dad, but um, my dad was telling me once, we was driving, speaking together to, at a conference, and um, over the years, he's been a faithful minister, faithful preacher, but sometimes when you're a faithful teacher and preacher, you're going to be accused of various things because people don't like that. Well, anyway, he has received a lot of accusations against him. And I was talking to my dad about that. And he says, he says, Jeff, I've not been perfect throughout my ministry, but I welcome anybody to jump into my brain, look around. Look around. And I thought about that for a while. What does he mean by that? What he's saying, he's saying this. I haven't been perfect, and if you look around into my past, you'll find flaw, mistake, sin. You'll find it. But if you keep looking, you'll see that I've been repentant. You've seen God's forgiveness. You've seen that right now I have a clear conscience before God. That is powerful, right? Well, when we're dealing with Muslims, we can be certain they do not have a clear conscience. And what we want to look at now in this session, does Islam provide an answer for a guilty conscience? Can it provide an answer to a guilty conscience? And I'll say up front, no. So what we want to do is, is look at Islam and talk to Muslims by saying, do you have a clear conscience? And then work with them. Can your religion provide you that? And show them that it can't. And then what a great segue, <clears throat> transition to explain. Let me tell you how you can have a clear conscience where God can be both just and righteous and forgiving sinners. But this, we're going to look at Islam's answer for guilt. Islam's answer for guilt. And I have five points. Here are the five points. Point number one, the five pillars. Point number two, the six articles of faith. Point three, submission to Allah. Point four, hope you get lucky. Point five, kill an infidel. This is Islam's answer to a clear conscience. Believe the five pillars. I mean, do the five pillars, believe the six articles of faith, 
Submit yourself to Allah. Hope you get lucky. Kill an infidel. Let's look at the first step. If you want to have a clear conscience with God, if you want salvation, they don't believe in becoming re reconciling with God or having a relationship with God. This is not about entering into a relationship with God. This is just about getting into paradise. First, you must accept the five pillars. First pillar is the Shahada. This is their creed. The creed is there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. So confess that earnestly that you believe there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. The second pillar is Salat, or that is the five daily prayers. We've talked about how Muhammad received those five prayers, from, went from 50 down to five. And these prayers are mandatory. You must pray. In fact, you're, you're, even your nominal Muslim will seek to pray five times a day. Uh, you can ask a Muslim, if you see how serious he is, ask him, do you pray five times a day? Do you carry out the slot? Some of them will say, well, I... Kind of like when you ask a Christian, I've been reading your Bible, nominal Christian, they'll say, well, well, I know I need to. The Even nominal Muslims will say, I know I need to be praying five times a day. I mean, that's the bare basics of Islam. But it's mandatory, and it's prescribed recitations of the Quran. So they're praying, not, they're praying sections of the Quran that's prescribed to them. And they pray it in Arabic. Now, what about prayers of like, hey, pray for my grandmother who's got cancer? Well, they're allowed to pray personal prayers in their own language, but only after they pray these prescribed mandatory prayers in Arabic. So these are what really matters is you pray the same thing every day at the same time of the day, near dawn, midday, late afternoon, at sunset, and at dark. These five set times you're to pray these things. Seven, uh, Surah 1778 says, establish regular prayers at the sun decline till the darkness of the night and then the morning prayer and reading. For the prayer and reading in the morning carried their testimony and pray in the small watches of the morning. Then at noon, soon will the Lord rise thee to praise and glory. So they're to pray that. In fact, just by praying these prayers, they have sins taken away from them. Another surah says in Surah 24, 58, O you who believe, let those whom your right hands possess and those whom you have not obtained publicly ask permission of thee three times before the morning prayer and when you put off your clothes at midday and in summer and after the prayer at nightfall. And according to Muhammad, prayer is disrupted or annoyed. Annulled. It, it, it doesn't count. If you're praying, it counts. God gives you credit. You gain something by these five prayers. But it, it doesn't count. You don't get credit for it if these things happen. If a dog pass in front of you. So you're, you're praying to Mecca, and if a dog goes before you, or a woman, or a donkey. So when you're praying, make sure a dog or woman or a donkey does not pass between you as you pray. One of the Hadiths says, when a man performs salat or prayer, there is nothing in front of him like the post of a saddle or a camel saddle. Then his prayer or salat is, is served by or severed or annoyed, annulled by passing of a black dog, a woman, and a donkey. It was said, what is the problem with the black dog rather than the red or white one? He said, oh, my nephew, I asked all his messenger just as you've asked me, and he said, a black dog 
is shaitan, the devil. So that's why you don't want a black dog to pass in front of you. Interesting, the Quran declares that Allah himself prays. And this is troubling. Allah prays. In Surah 33, 43, he, talking about Allah, is, it is he who prays for you and his angels too. Surah 33, 56, Verily God and his angels pray for the prophet. O ye who believe, pray for him. So here we see that God himself prays. Now we believe that Jesus as a man prays to the Father. But that's not a contradiction. But here we have all a praying. Who's all a praying to? Well, that's the second pillar. The third pillar is fasting. Um, fasting in Arabic swan means to abstain. In the religious context, they're to fast from food, beverages, including water, and sexual intercourse during the daylight hours. So you can eat and do normal activities after the sun sets, but during the daylight hours, they're to fast. And they're to do this during the month of Ramadan. Surah 2, 184 says, The month of Ramadan is in which was revealed in the Quran a guidance for mankind and clear proof of the guidance and the citation of right and wrong. And whosoever of you is present, let him fast this month. And whosoever of you is sick or on a journey, let him fast the same number of other days. Allah desires for your ease. He desires not hardship for you, he desires that you should complete the period and that you should magnify Allah and having guided you and being that, you be thankful. So that is the third. The fourth is the pilgrimage that they need to make to Mecca at least once in their lifetime. Uh, then is almsgiving. The fifth pillar. Surah 960 says, The alms are not only for poor and the needy and those who collect them and are those whose hearts are to be reconciled and to the free and the captives and to the debtors and for the cause of Allah. So the Quran says the alms are for the needy, for the poor, and for good causes. But during the time of the rightly guided caliphs, the, the alms were given directly to the caliph. Indeed, Adu Bakr, the first caliph who succeeded Muhammad, began to persecute the Muslims that did not pay him this alms. In fact, in one of the hadiths about Abu Bakr, it says, By Allah, I will fight him who discriminates between the alms and prayer for alms is compulsory right to be taken from the wealth. By Allah, if they refuse to give it to me, they refuse to give it to Allah. I will fight them for withholding it. So the caliphs begin to take this alms for themselves as their personal payment. So that is the first step. If you want to be a Muslim and have a clear conscience, do the five pillars. Second one, you need to believe in the six articles of faith, which are these. One, believe in the oneness of God. In fact, this is the heart of Muhammad, uh, Islam's theology, is God is one. Surah 112, say he is Allah, the one, Allah, the absolute. He begets not, nor was he begotten, and there is nothing comparable to him. Surah 39.4, he is Allah, the one. He's one. Now, by this, they don't mean one in number. Because if there's one in number, that means there must be a two. One implies two. For Allah, there's no second. There's no... He's one. But what that means is that he's complete unity. And there's no division or differentiation between him. 
All that he is, he is what he is without any division. And we'll look at this tomorrow morning when we're talking about the Trinity. But we see in Islam, God cannot be understood or known because there's no association with him. You cannot say God is love because love would be something that is contributed to Allah and you cannot add anything to Allah. Allah is something that's completely unknowable. There's no differentiation within him. So he can't be loving and good and merciful and wise in his very essence. Because by saying he's this and he's that, that means there's some least some differentiation between who he is. He is complete unity. And that complete unity means he's unknowable. You cannot know who he is. Thus he is one. In fact, the greatest sin in Islam is the sin of Shrek, which is associating anything with God. At least 87 verses speak of this sin, of the sin of association. Surah 4, 116, Allah will not forgive those who associate anything with Him. 572, they displease those who say God is the Messiah, the Son of Mary. But the Messiah himself said, O children of Israel, worship God, my Lord and your Lord. Whoever associates others with God, God has forbidden him from paradise. And his dwelling is in the fire. The wrongdoers have no savers. They disbelieve those who say God is the third of three. But there is no deity except the one God. And if they do not refrain from what they say, a painful torment will befall those who among them who disbelieve. Will they not repent to God and ask for forgiveness? God is forgiving and merciful. The Messiah, son of Mary, was only a messenger. Before him, other messengers had passed away, and his mother was a woman of truth. They both used to eat food. That's why we know Messiah is not God. He ate. So this is the sin, the greatest sin. This is the un unpardonable sin. If you die believing that there's any association with God, then you've committed the sin of Shrek. However, I wonder how they get around believing the Quran is eternal. How can you have something eternal that's not God, that's eternal? Is that not some form of differentiation between God and His Word and something that's both God's eternal and His Word is eternal? Yet, I, yet that is, I think, a real problem. Here's another article of faith. The second one is belief in the prophets. You have to believe that God sent the prophet. Not only that Muhammad is the prophet or the messenger of God, but that God has sent prophets to all the nations. Now, Islam will not tell you all the names of all the prophets, but they believe that every nation in all periods have been sent a prophet. But the prophet that they recognized are Adam, Noah, Abraham, Lot, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Job, Moses, Aaron, David, Solomon, Jonah, Jesus, and finally Muhammad. In fact, Surah 1636, it says, to every community was sent a messenger Worship Allah and avoid idolatry. Some of them Allah guided while others deserved misguidance. So travel through the earth and see what the fate of the deniers are. The basic messages of the prophet is Islam. Surah 5.15, O people of the book, our messenger has come to you, clarifying for you, of much what was kept hidden of the book, and overlooking much. A light from Allah has come to you, and a clear book. Allah guides with it whoever follows his approval to the ways of peace, and he brings them out of darkness into light by his permission, and he guides them in a straight path. So, Muhammad is saying the Old Testament books, the Torah and the Gospel, is a clear book. It's a reliable book. And its teachings 
the same thing the Quran is teaching. Surah 1037, the Quran could not have been produced by anyone other than Allah. In fact, it is a confirmation of what preceded it, an elaboration of the book. There is no doubt about it. It is from the Lord of the universe. So they believe in the prophets and believe that Muhammad is the seal of the prophets. You believe in all the prophets that preceded Muhammad, but Muhammad is the last prophet. He comes and seals up the gift of prophets to the world. The third article of belief is belief in the books or in the scriptures. You believe in the Torah and the gospel. We've already read some of those um, passages where it says the scriptures, the Torah, the gospel are are reliable sources of revelation that has come to us from God or from Allah himself. In belief that <clears throat> the books are unchangeable. Surah 6, 14. Shall I seek a judge other than Allah when he is the one who has revealed to you the book explained in detail? Those to whom we gave the book know that it is the truth revealed from your Lord. So do not be of those who doubt. The word of your Lord has been completed in truth and justice. There is no changing to his words. He is the hearer, the knower. So the Quran says the books have come from God and the books cannot be changed. Now Muslims believe that the Quran cannot be changed. It's perfectly transmitted throughout its historical presence on earth. And we have today the Quran as it's originally given to Muhammad, and he was given the exact copy of that which is eternally printed on the plates of gold in heaven. But the Quran is saying all of God's revelation, all of his books are unchangeable. This would have to mean if God's word is unchangeable, how do you have to deal with the, the text of abrogation? Praying to Jerusalem, how do you change that if it's unchangeable and secondly would not the Gospels and the Torah still be unchangeable would not the Gospels and Torah still have to be a revelation that could not be corrupted over time according to the Quran it has to be and that's one of the articles of faith that believe not only in the prophets but believe in the books Thirdly, you must believe in angels and jinn. Angels, chief one of them being Gabriel, but there are many angels that they believe in. But they also believe in jinn, and jinn are human-like angelic beings. They're half humans, half angels. Some of them are good or bad. But Muslims believe every person, including you and me and everyone else, have two angels that sit on our shoulders. You have a, a good angel, and a demon. The good angel wants your good. And so every time, every time you do something good, it writes it down. And by the way, Muslims do not believe you can sin in your heart. Jesus says if you look on a woman and lust after her, you have sinned in your heart. Muslims don't believe that. Muslims think if you, what you do in your heart or in your imagination or conscience, God doesn't care about that. It's only your outward deeds that he's recording. So he's not worried about, about what you're thinking. And no wonder, you know, Muslims, when you press them, they're, many of them are addicted to pornography, they're addicted to all kinds of stuff, but they don't, they, they get a pass for this stuff. Because it's not their imagination or their thoughts that God's worried about, it's their deeds. And as they're doing deeds, these good or bad angels are recording down what they're doing, their life. And the good angels are recording down all the good you've done. The bad angel is every time you stumble, mess up, he's writing down those things. And, and they're writing these books. And these are the books that your angels are recording for you or that are going to be opened up on the day of judgment. And they're going to be read aloud. And you'll be judged from the books from your two angels that reside on your shoulders. Another belief, six articles of faith, is belief in the resurrection, the day of judgment. Surah 636, ask for the dead, Allah will re resurrect them. 
Surah 18, 49, and the book will be placed and you will see the sinners be fearful of its contents and they will say, woe to us, what is with the book that leaves nothing small or big? They will find everything that had been done present. Your Lord does not wrong anyone. Surah 69, 18, on the day you will be exposed and no secret of yours will remain hidden. As for him who has given his book in his right hand, he will say, Here, take my book and read it. I knew I would be held accountable, so he will be in the present living, in a lofty garden. Its pickings are within reach. Eat and drink merrily in what you did in the days gone by. But as for him who has given his book in his left hand, he will say, I wish I was never given my book. And never knew what my count was. If only it was the end. My money cannot avail me now. My power has vanished me. Take him and shackle him. And scorch him in the blaze. So you're going to have two books. These books will be put on the scales. These divine scales. And which book tilts. You'll be judged by that. And God will give you the book. If you have the scale tips in favor, you'll be given the good book. You'll have that. You go to paradise. If the bad book wins out, you'll be given that, and you'll go to the flames of fire. The sixth article of faith is belief and predestination. Surah 28, 68, your Lord created whatever he wills, and he chooses. The choice is not theirs. Glory be to Allah. Surah 57, 22, no calamity occurs on earth or in your souls, but is in a book. Even before we make it happen, this is easy for Allah. Now, they believe in predestination, but not in the same way we do. We believe in predestination as Reformed Baptists, but we believe in the doctrine of concurrence, that God has chosen to use secondary means. And the secondary means that God has chosen to use to, to do everything according to His purpose and will are the laws of nature and the nature of men or volition. God doesn't force us to do something against our will, nor does He typically violate the laws of nature. Now, He can. We call that a miracle. But normally, He carries out His purposes and plans through secondary means. He works along with Secondary means like the laws of nature. He's sovereign over these things, but he's, he's guiding these things through this. That's why God is not the author of sin. He's not directly controlling sin, but indirectly controlling it. So he remains holy and just, but yet sovereign. So we need that doctrine of concurrence to be consistent with a all-knowing, powerful, sovereign God who believe, we do believe in providence, but yet we don't make God the author of sin. Well, Islam believes in providence, in predestination. We wouldn't call it providence. They believe in predestination, but they do not have a doctrine of concurrence. In fact, God does things, he does good and he does evil in the same act of sense. We believe in active decrees and passive decrees, yet God is sovereign over all things. We believe that. But in Islam, God does everything actively. In fact, one hadith says this. Is this a hadith about Muhammad the prophet? He says, Adam and Moses argued with each other. Moses said to Adam, Adam? You are our father who disappointed us and turned us out of paradise. So Moses is angry with Adam for the fall. Then Adam said to him, O oh Moses, Allah favored you with his talk, and he wrote the Torah for you with his own hand. Do you blame me for actions which Allah had written in my fate 40 years before my creation? So Adam is saying, you can't blame me for my sins. God, 40 years before I was created, ordained this in a book. It came about by his providence or his predestination. I'm not responsible for it. In fact, one leading Muslim scholar says this. 
Not only can Allah do anything, he's actually the only one who does anything. When a man writes, it is Allah who created his mind, the will to write, Allah is the same time gives power to write, then brings about the motion of the hand and the pen and the appearance upon paper. All other things are passive. Allah alone is active. This is fatalism. This makes God the author of sin. But the, nevertheless, this is the sixth article of faith for Islam, believing in predestination. Well, you got the five pillars, the six articles of faith. The third thing, if you want a clear conscience, is submit. Submit to Allah or be obedient. In fact, this is the heart of Islam, is the duty of submission. In fact, the word Muslim comes from the word slave, one who is submissive to Allah, who obeys Allah. One Muslim or former Muslim writes, It is generally agreed that according to Orthodox Islam, the purpose of man is not to know God or to become more conformed to his character, but, uh, but to understand his will and to be more obedient to his commands. So this is the nature of Islam, is to know the will of Allah and to be obedient, to serve Allah as faithful servants. Surah 2, 177. Righteousness does not consist of turning your face towards the east or the west, but righteousness is he who believes in Allah and the last day and in the angels and the scriptures and the prophets, who gives money, though dear and near, to relatives and orphans and to needy and to the homeless and to beggars, and for the freeing of slaves, those who perform the prayers and pay uh, the the charitable giving and fulfill their promise when they promise and patiently preserve in the face of persecution, hardship in the time of conflict. These are the sincere, these are the pious. So this is the essential duties of Muslims. Surah 510, those who believe and do deeds of righteousness has God's promised forgiveness and a great reward. So if you want forgiveness, do good. This is how you secure forgiveness. Surah 951, say nothing will happen to us except what Allah has ordained for us. Surah 3213, had he willed, we could have given every soul its guidance. But the declaration from me will come true. I will fill hell with jinn and humans altogether. So God could have saved everybody, but in his active decree, we believe in election, at least assume we believe in election, but not double predestination. Not, not that God doesn't send people to hell in the same active sense that he sends people to hell or chooses people to heaven. But people go to hell based upon their own unrighteousness. But here we see that God does as his will. He could have brought everybody to the truth, but he determined to fill hell with jinn and humans. So this is the third step, if you want a clear conscience. Obedience. The fourth step. Hope you get lucky. I say that, and maybe that's not the terms that we would use if we were talking to Muslims. But in the end, all Muslims are still hoping. We have a hope of we have a hope of we're longing to expect something that we know will come to be. But their hope is truly like wishing. They're hoping they make it. Surah 310 says this: God is strict and retribution. God is strict and retribution. That is very scary. Even for Muslims, you need to say, you have a God who is strict in judgment. We do too. We do too. God is strict in His judgment. 
He's strict in his retribution. Would that not scare you? If you had no perfect righteousness that was imputed to you? My God, Jehovah, God of the Bible, God of Jesus Christ, is also just, precisely just. But I have a precise righteousness. Muslims do not have that. But yet they still have a God who's strict in judgment. They believe in the scales. I don't understand how God can be strict and retribution, but also judge you according to the balance of the scales. How can that be just? How can it be just if... <clears throat> well, my wife's cousin, first cousin, was murdered in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, by a serial killer when she was in college at the University of Louisiana, Louisiana State University. The, the, the man who murdered Letha's cousin, Sissy is her name, just died this week. On the plane ride here, we saw that he died of heart failure. He was in his 40s. He died. He killed at least seven women. Not, maybe more. What would it have been like if the judge took this man? And the reason they, uh, they convicted him is because um, Letha's cousin's DNA was under his fingernails. What would have happened if the judge looked at this man and says, okay, hey man, you were a great father. You made good grades. You've, you've really... An outstanding citizen. You haven't been known as a liar. You've been faithful, truthful. You've been good friends with all the all childhood. You were a great kid. And I see that you made a mistake here. But relatively speaking, that mistake is, you know, you made this mistake, but look at the rest of your life. I'm going to go ahead and let you go off. I'm going to let you out. I'm going to forgive you. How can that be a just judge and, and say, I forgive you? You see, the truth is, if you're going to judge strictly like the Quran says God will do, you can be the perfect man your whole life, your whole life, and make one sin, and all of a sudden you're guilty. You're guilty. Well, so here the Muslims... They're in this, i got to believe in the five pillars, do the five pillars, believe the six articles, I have to be submissive to Allah. But in the end, they're still waiting the day of judgment. Right now, they just don't know. They can't be certain that they're going to make it. How is God going to judge? Is He going to look at these deeds? How is He going to weigh these things? I really don't know. They can't know. So thus, they're left just hoping they have no assurance. In fact, because the doctrine of predestination isn't, it doesn't even it even doesn't matter if they think that they have their life is basically full of good deeds, if they're not predestinated to go to heaven, it doesn't matter. In fact, one hadith writes: All is apostle, the truthful and truly inspired, said. Each one of you collected in the womb of his mother for 40 days. Then Allah sends an angel and orders him to write four things. So after you're conceived in the womb, after 40 days from conception, an angel comes and writes four things over you. His provisions, how rich or poor you're going to be. His age, the age that you're going to live to before you die. And whether he'll be of the wretched or the blessed in the hereafter. He's going to write if you're going to go to heaven hell before you're born, 40 days after your conception. Then the soul is breathed into them, and by all a person among you, or a man, may do deeds of the people of the fire. But then that writing, which Allah has ordered the angel to write, proceeds, 
and he does the deeds of the people of paradise and enters it. And a man may do the deeds of the people of paradise until there is only a cubit or two between him and paradise, and then the writing proceeds, and he does the deeds of the people of fire and enters it. Let me break that down. You can be a faithful Muslim all your life. Believe in the, the six articles of faith, do the five pillars, be submissive to all of the best of your abilities. But if the angel did not write paradise on you, you can be one cubit to paradise. I mean, on the verge of death, almost your whole life, and be just, just on the verge of judgment. And then if you're not written paradise, you will do the deeds of the book of the fire and you will go to the fire. And otherwise, you can be a rebellious Allah forsaker, don't even care about Islam your whole life and be one cubit away from hell. But if it's written paradise on you, you'll do the deeds of those who go to paradise and God will send you to paradise. If that is truly what they believe, what assurance can anyone have? You're left just uncertain about future judgment. I am so thankful that we believe in justification by faith. That my judgment is already passed. Now, I do believe in a future judgment, but justification is God already declaring a verdict. And I have been declared already forgiven. I know now that my sins are gone. I go to bed and I rest. The guilt is removed. We have a true answer to guilt. We have a God who is just because of Christ who took away our sins on the cross and He imputes to us His righteousness, giving us who have faith clear, clear conscience. Rest. Rest now. But Muslims have no rest, no real assurance. One of the most important theologians who lived in the 13th century wrote this, the Islamic theologians, and he's revered by most Muslims. It'd be like a Matthew Henry of our day, you know. So we all love Matthew Henry. Writes this. Yet all the fathers used to refrain from giving a definite reply concerning belief and were extremely careful not to commit themselves in the connection, he says, he who says, I am a believer in the sight of God is a liar. And he who says, I really am a believer is an innovator. Once upon a time, Hussein was asked, this is the fifth or sixth caliph, was asked, art thou a believer? In which he replied, if it be the will of God. Are you a Christian? We say yes. For Muslims, they cannot say, I truly believe. Because they don't know. Well, this leads me to my final step. Fifth way of assurance is kill an inf infidel. Well, you can imagine if there's no assurance through good deeds, through what you believe in your actions, the only assurance that the Quran can provide you is if you kill an infidel, you immediately, or if you're killed in battle, you immediately, you immediately go to paradise. Surah 929, Fight those who believe not in Allah, nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and His Messenger, nor acknowledge the righteous, the, the religion of truth from among the people of the book until they pay the tax with a willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Goes on to say in the same Surah. O prophet, strive hard against the unbelievers and the hypocrites and be young, unyielding to them. For their abide is in hell. And then it says later on at the end of the chapter, or the Surah, surely Allah has brought of the believers their persons and their property for this, that they shall have the garden. They that fight in Allah's way, they that are slain and are slain. So here is the only sure certainty that you're going to paradise if you happen to kill an infidel or to be killed by an infidel for the cause of Allah. Now, if you have a troubled past, which all people do, 
If you have guilt and you're looking for a cure to it, you can see why suicide bombings could be appealing. Why would anybody be willing to die? This is insane. Their heart's troubled. They have a troubled heart. They're looking for certainty. They're looking for peace. They're looking to be forgiven. This is the best that Islam can do for them. We have a religion well, we don't have to kill to be forgiven. We have a religion truly that we can have peace. You see, Islam does not have a just God. The Quran says in 3.11, God is strict in retribution. But we see, according to predestination, he has a, actively he puts people into heaven, actively he puts people into hell in the same active sense. And this has nothing to do with their good or bad deeds. How can he be just and send people to hell just based upon his decree, irregardless of their actions? Allah therefore does not judge with strict retribution. Or if he did, none would be saved. We see Allah is arbitrary in the way he deals with people. You don't know how he's going to deal. Is he going to be strict or is he going to be forgiving? Is he going to be merciful? Am I predestinated? Am I not? I won't know until I go to, until I face judgment. This is why Islam cannot provide any real assurance of salvation. It cannot eliminate guilt. And the only real remedy for forgiveness, a remedy for our guilt problem, is to have a just God who sent his son to die for our sins. Aren't you glad you're a Christian? I know I am. Let's, let's pray. Dear Lord, we rejoice in the beauty of Christianity. We rejoice the fact that you are just God and that all of our sins are forgiven in Christ Jesus. Blessed be his name who took our sins and died for them. They've been paid for and we can be declared just at this time in our life and know that we are forgiven. Thank you for the blessedness it is to go to bed at night and rest, to know that we are forgiven. And I pray that if there's anyone here, dear Lord, that's struggling with guilt, that is uneased about their own sins, I pray that, Lord, that you would convict them that they've sinned against you. And it's a very grievous thing. But Lord, I pray that you, you said it's the goodness of God that leads man to repentance. I pray, dear Lord, that you show them Yourself, show them your son. And Lord, Lord, we pray that you lead them to repentance. This we pray in your son's name.